and I am the Community and Family Outreach Director for a nonprofit called Battlefield Addiction. Um, our mission is to eliminate the suffering of individuals, families, and communities impacted by addiction. Um, I, I don't know much about the job title, I have to say that my boss, Angie, our director, <laughs> gave that to me. We're a small organization, we all wear a lot of hats. And the truth is that I'm first and foremost a mother and a wife who benefited from the guidance and coaching of Bathful Addiction co-founders Art and Angie Dahl, and they're sitting right here in front of me. I feel it is their commitment to the unvarnished truth about what happens when addiction shows up in a family that has impacted me the most and ultimately has led me here to Rotary today. Uh, Art and Angie would make great Rotarians, I have to say, because they live their life and exemplify the spirit of Rotary's four-way test every day. In addition to their commitment to the truth, their insight and finesse in fairly assessing the implosive situation families find themselves in, their skill in helping them repair and rebuild their relationships, and their wisdom in strategically coaching them towards a successful outcome that is beneficial to the whole family is remarkable and unmatched in my experience. And this is the reason that I also want to openly share the truth about my experience with the next family that is suffering. With that said, I'd like to introduce you to Art Dawn, who is a co-founder and visionary of Battlefield Addiction. He is also the owner and creator of an innovative drug and alcohol program called Rebuild Recovery. Not only a treatment provider, Art is also a highly effective family and recovery coach who has led thousands of family members and individuals through strategic interventions for the past 13 years. His 17 years in active addiction has equipped him with the insight and skills to effectively lead family members and their addicted loved ones out of the woods and into long-term recovery. In addition, Art's work has attracted a substantial followers, you got a few over here, <laughs> and um, his straightforward approach and wisdom from true lived experience, he has gained much respect in the addiction recovery field and continues to gain more and more attention from city officials and organizations needing assistance and guidance with the issue that we are all facing. Art is not only a man that I believe in wholeheartedly to help lead families and communities out of this drug crisis, he is also, unlike me, a thought-provoking, passionate, entertaining, and sometimes colorful speaker. You ready, Art? <laughs> Are you all ready? Yeah. Okay, great. Ah, thank you. Uh, she made me cry. Um, well, she said it all. So, uh, uh, yeah, you guys got any questions? Uh, <laughs> you know, this is my third time speaking at a Rotary, and, and I hope. I think the first time I did it, I really aggravated a lot of people, and then I aggravated people less the next time, and so <laughs> hopefully it's improving, and I don't aggravate you all. Um, you know, so when you get into this kind of stuff, it's, uh, well, I'll just start where, where we started. You know, it started from 17 years of active addiction, and led to my own homelessness, and my own living in my car, and the destruction of my family, and um, I came from a very good home upper middle class home with great parents and two beautiful sisters and extended family everywhere and I tore that family apart with my limb and um, um, going through that process eventually I was um, stopped by my family and they made it very clear that I couldn't go any further and I'd, I'd have to change and to, to, to meet the standards of our family and I think God they did that for me because it, it, it's what saved my life and I was at 37 years old, and um, after that, I just I didn't know what to do with my life. So they asked me if I had a bullet point. I don't know how to do one of those, so I don't have any bullet points. I'm still working on email. Pretty soon, I might, you know, 13 years I've been sober now. I might be able to send an email pretty soon. But um, Angie does that for me, and so uh, we right away when I got sober, I just didn't know what else to do, so I started helping out. I didn't know um, that I was going to be very good at it, but I just didn't have any other skills, and I hadn't worked in about eight years, never had a job, so um, basically what I did was I just started helping people uh, like me, 
and around me that were maybe younger than me or people that didn't know. And, and I guess I'll start using the word streetwise right now because I think that that's what it is. And it's an honor to speak to people like you all because you're wise. And, and I know that you've been through a lot of stuff with business. And I just went a different direction in my life. I spent a lot of time learning about the streets and learning what's going on on there. And, and, and so I got sober. I started um, sober living and it was really easy. I just, you know, went to a house and put people up and I took on everybody. And very shortly into my sobriety, about a year and a half sober, I was operating about eight sober houses. And eventually I met a business partner and I was able to call him out some money and he helped me start a treatment center. And, um, and you know, eventually it led me to meeting Angie. And, and I always knew that as I was helping just the addict, the battlefield addiction is not helping family. And I, I say addict still, I know it's, it's frowned upon sometimes, but I'm an addict and I, I, I really probably won't change the way I talk. So I say addict and if that, sometimes you tell me that I should say substance use disorder, but to me I'd rather be an addict than a person with a disorder. So I, uh, I, I like to stick with what I know. So when I met Angie, I always knew that um, I needed help supporting families, and I had a lot of, at, at one point, about two years sober, I was housing about 80 to 100 um, recovery addicts, and, and um, it, was, it was a lot. And what I, knew, what I knew was there was something missing. There was family support that was missing. And I needed to get into that realm, and, and a lot of times the families just didn't trust me or didn't know me because I didn't have the letters behind my name and I didn't have the background. And when I met Angie about two, or two years ago in 2013, she was married and she had a son that was um, um, in addiction and she came to me for help. And once I began to coach her and help her, um, that led to this other thing where Angie had a big network and we started bringing in families. And um, really early on, you know, there's a lot of mixed messages when you have a, a, someone in your family that's suffering from this. There's a lot of mis mixed messages, and I think there's a, a reason there's mixed messages is because there's a lot of different things you need to do, and every case is unique. And the problem becomes when you try to take those mixed messages and apply it to your situation, and not, even, not understanding that every situation is different. And so what we had to do was we had to create unique ways to handle each situation. And, and for whatever reason, I had a, a skill of being able to sit with these families and understand their situation and understand how unique it is and then apply some type of intervention, some type of strategy. And I'm not, I don't sit with, um, I don't sit with people who are addicted and try to tell them to go get treatment and do outreach with that. I sit with the families and we do it systematically by, by kind of choking out um, the, the addiction and getting the person to be not enabled and to be um, actually kind of forced in the right direction. And um, so that Angie and I began that process and expanding fairly quickly. We just we worked with thousands of families. And um, you know, our, our theoretical, my theoretical approach to addiction is that it's, it's gotta be held responsible. Um, that's just how I approach it. Um, whether the person got into addiction because they were traumatized or because they came, it doesn't matter in my opinion. In my, in my opinion, that individual is thought of as a real person, a real person that has a chance of independence, and a real person that isn't going to be dependent on anything the rest of their life. And so I like to approach to addiction that has something to do with abstinence and something to do with independence and something to do with the person becoming responsible for their life. So we use that. When it comes to the family, we want the whole family to be reconnected again. We want everybody in the family to come back together, whether we can stand each other or what. We're gonna be in a room together and we're gonna to figure it out. We're gonna get through our resentments and we're gonna get through. See, addiction doesn't tear a family apart. I don't believe that's true, but what tears a family apart is not knowing what to do and fighting over it. So really it's the fighting over what to do is what tears the family apart. Everybody gets together and argues about what to do and nobody really knows what to do and everybody kind of is, is misled by what they hear they say so, um, and I don't think you can just apply a one size fits all. So, um, and that was very good. You know, for years we went on just doing this family thing, and we stayed kind of stayed out of the community realm. You know, we saw in about 2016 around here it started to get a little, in our opinion, my opinion, it started to get a little crazy in 2016. Meaning they started decriminalizing things, and that kind of stuff started happening, and they started saying people could steal and not get arrested. And, Probation got pretty lax, and then they started not arresting for drug crimes and possession, and 
And he, to me, it was crazy, and they were going the wrong direction. And I was like, well, man, this is, this is making it really difficult for us to do our job because nobody's coming to us with any consequences. Nobody's held, being held accountable, so nobody wants treatment anymore. And that seemed to lead to this big uprise or this big um, kind of burst of, of homelessness and, and, and really these services that were going on in perpetuity and people just needing services and not getting to independence. And, you know, that kind of became like, oh, man. And when you said something kind of logical out there in the community, I almost got my head chopped off most of the time because people didn't want to hear it. I had times where I'd go to a homeless um, committee. I went to a homeless committee one time and I brought five guys that were homeless in that city and now recovered and um, doing well. They didn't want to hear from us. So it was shocking they didn't want to hear from us. They said, we like to do evidence-based stuff. And I said, well, here we are. We're here, we're all sober. We'll tell you what you did wrong. We'll tell you why we stayed on your streets. We'll tell you how you made it easy for us. We'll tell you all that right here. And then they just became, they just kind of been doing more of that. And then recently we saw there started becoming a shift. And, you know, and, and then something else happened. You know, this was all fun and games. We used to have a very good energy and everything was really, with families, we were excited and we brought great energy and then something started happening. The drugs got different. And the drugs are different now. And the drugs are killing people. And so it got a little serious. And then this serious is allowing people to do these drugs and kill themselves um, in the name of compassion was something that we started looking at. So we gotta speak out. We gotta get out there and say, man, would you want your loved one to be allowed to use these drugs on the streets and just die? And would that be compassion for you? No, if your loved one was on the streets using these drugs like fentanyl and meth, you want to stop today. You would hope that they get arrested. You would hope that something could happen that they could get intervened on and get, get saved. And so that became kind of like, we started seeing that more and more people were talking about it. And so now, as we work with the out here, we have our philosophy and we do the things we do with our families. But now we're starting to meet with lawmakers and we're starting to bring them into what I want to do is I want to bridge the gap between lawmakers and the families and the people that are suffering from that because I think that there is a gap. I think that the, the people that are making the laws might not know how those laws are affecting the families that are suffering from it. And so putting these lawmakers on both sides and saying we need logical, X, we need logical ideas, we need common sense ideas, we need ideas that save people and not make this problem worse, you know, really early on in my life when I decided I want to help people, I had to, I had to say to myself what help would mean. And so I had to define that. And for me, I defined help as somebody's life would improve by being around me. And when we say we're helping people but their life isn't improving, I argue that we're not. I argue that there's something wrong. So when people's life aren't improving and you're telling me you're helping them, I just, I don't believe you. So we have to get out, we have to do, we have to create laws that help. We have to create things that help, not punish, not hurt, but help. And a lot of our families right now, you know, and I don't want to be grim, but we're going, we spend a lot of our time in battlefield addiction now. We have something called Beyond the Battle. And Angie was created because she lost her own son in 2016 to a heroin overdose. And Angie has created Beyond the Battle, and it's growing. It's growing rapidly. And, and we spend our time dealing with the, the <laughs> aftermath of a lack of accountability and a lack of responsibility, and somebody being allowed to do a drug that basically will kill them at any time they use it. So <clears throat> now we have a thing called the hot seat that we're doing at my program house in Kent, and we've brought in people like Mark Bullock, who's running for governor, and we've brought in um, Andrew Suarez, who's running for legislative district, uh, Raul Garcia. We have uh, uh, Mari Levitt coming uh, the 13th of, of, of uh, August. We have uh, radio hosts like Ari Hoffman is coming, and we have Riker coming, and we're trying to get a hold of Bob Ferguson, but he's not, not very easy to get a hold of so far, so we're working on that. But that's the work that we're doing right now, and, and it's a real honor for us to come because uh, my street smart approach um, doesn't always get it done. Um, I need people that have business approach. I need people like you all that can help us. And me and Angie will spend every single day of our life trying to help and we will fight, but we need help. 
We need help from people like you guys that can help us with our mission. They can see it and can say, you know, this is a cause we want to get behind. We want to get behind people if you if you believe in, in, in taking a human being that's suffering from addiction and, and seeing the results of what happens when they become an independent human being and they're back on their own. And when you see a family that's torn apart come back together, and we see a community that has homelessness on the streets and everything happening out there, and we can clean up the streets and we can make it a grassroots movement to do kind of that kind of thing, that's what's going on right now for us. And, and it's a really exciting time, also a really dangerous time. So, you know, that's what we're dealing with. And I just wanted to thank you guys for, for letting me explain our mission. We sit with families over and over who've lost. We sit with families that are worried they're gonna lose. And all of our services at Battlefield Addiction are free. Everything we do at Battlefield Addiction for families is free, it's all by donors. We do, we do group coaching with parents, we do private coaching with parents, we do consultations with families. We sit and do it every day. And Angie, my wife now, luckily for me, at some point she became my wife along this journey. And now we spend our time together as, as husband and wife, and this is what we do. And um, it's an honor to do what we do. It's, it's um, and we need, we need people like you to help support us and see the mission and um, help us take it to the next level so more people get the opportunity to to get the knowledge of the streetwide knowledge that, that Battlefield has. And, and that's kind of the deal when family, when it shows up in a family, some of the families don't have that kind of streetwide wise knowledge to see what they can do. And some of them are getting duped. And, and so it's important to have a guy like me, I think, to, to help you guide, guide, guide your family through that. So um, that's about all I have. And I'll just take any questions yeah. if you have. Yeah, questions, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That is a uh, really heart wrenching situation that you're describing. You talked about speaking to the legislature. Do you find that in general, governments don't want to see you or talk to you? Is that a problem for you? Depends on if it's election season or not. <laughs> Before they get elected, man, they all want to talk to me. Yeah. yeah. It, it seems that there are probably some, in your view, great successes, and you, maybe you can tell us how that happens, and great failures, and what causes that. I, I think that currently in Washington State, and I'll be blunt, I think it is a series of bad ideas followed by more bad ideas. And I've never seen the endless stream of bad ideas and nonsense that can be produced when somebody doesn't have experience with this thing trying to dictate policy. And I think that's what's going on. It's not a evil intent. It's not bad people. It's good people that haven't got the knowledge base to be doing what they do. And I'll hear people say things like to me like, oh, I've got a lot of experience. I've had, I've had addiction in my family. That's not experience. That's one thing that happened to you. Wait till you deal with a thousand families. Wait till you deal with 2,000 families. See, every day I learn. And I can't, I don't have experience just because of my 17 years in addiction. I had to meet thousands more acts to get their story to get experience. So I just think that it's a, it's a gap. It's just a gap. And, and that's what we need to do is we need to close the gap. Be, and we need to get them in front of families that have this experience and people that have this experience so we can close that gap and say, listen, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. That's a waste of money. So. Where are you located? And how many people do you have working for you? It seems to me you're dealing with thousands of people. You, know, you can't spread yourself out that thin. So you must have other people doing some of the work for the families and stuff. There's, I, I, and I, this is just a theory of mine. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's true. But I think that there's nonprofits that are really good at what they do. And I think there's nonprofits that are really good at raising money. We happen to be a nonprofit that we believe is really good at what we do, but we're really poor at raising money. So I, I don't have the staff that I want, 
I don't have the stuff that we need. Angie is overworked, Becky is overworked, and Becky's retired. She's trying to run her life, but you know she's still doing this, so no, we need funds so that we can scale this and get more out there. And as, you know, we're very short staffed, so. about a year ago that I called and um, my son, so one of our nine kids has gone down this very, very hard path and believe me, people don't talk about this, right? They don't talk about it and you don't know what to do as a parent and you try so many different things. Um, we've gotten our son to uh, want to go to detox and no place around here would take him for three days. There were no openings. There were no beds open. So I found a place in LA and he had flown down there, Jack had taken him to the gate to get him on that plane. He went in, he came out of that place and said, Dad, oh, this is sketch, I'm not staying here. And he calls me from the LA export, that airport and, and I'm like, I'm not bringing you home. And I didn't know what to do, but I knew I couldn't bring him home. And so I called, and for the first time in all this journey, I had this amazing conversation. And, um, and Angie and Art understood. It was like, what is happening? They said, get him on an airplane and have him fly to Las Vegas because they have different locations. Uh, they, he said, yes, he'd go. And that was a year ago. And um, our son has been living in sober living and battlefield addiction for the last year. And I have to say he's doing very well. And he's been sober for around 100 days. And he has a job in Seattle. And he knows he still needs the resources. Um, but I, we've been to a lot of different places. And this has worked. And I just have such gratitude for the two of you. Um, I just want to say, this is a conversation that we are not having in our culture. It is the biggest killer. The opioid is the biggest killer, far more than COVID. And we do not have this conversation. And I am so grateful for the two of you and for engaging not just rotaries, but the officials, the legislature, and for being a place to have the conversation. But I just want to thank you for giving me back my son. Yeah. Great. So, we checked into uh, becoming eligible for medical plans pay for your services. Um, I've had it. I've had an insurance-based office before. I'm not very good at it. Um, we, we, we haven't. Um, a lot of the times, I'm not a very good rule follower. Um, <laughs> so the things that I do are kind of out of the box. And the things that I do, my, my program is more boutique and it's cash. And I do that because I want to help people the way that I think I was helped and the way that it needs to happen, in my opinion. And it's tough to get, um, especially this state, to, to buy into it. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, the uh, point of people dying in the streets today, and it sounds like fentanyl is the driver here. Mm -hmm. What recommendations do you have in terms of why suddenly fentanyl has become just so spread around the whole country and killing, I understand, 90,000 people a year. Oh. What in the world is the federal government doing while we oh. watch this happen? More than that. Well, I think, I think right now um, they're just catching up to it. Um, I don't think, I think that they're way behind on what's going on. And I, any way that I can tell you why this drug came here would be a, a theory and I don't have any practical evidence of that. I just know it's here, 
And I know that we have laws in the books, such as Ricky's Law. And it is a law that went in the books in 2019. And this is forced mandated treatment for people who are a danger to themselves or others. And I'm working with Mark Mullet, and I'm working with people right now. Mark's been in the Senate for 12 years, and I've been talking to him. And I go, why do they keep talking about like it's new? Why are they talking about mandated treatment like it's a bad thing and why it's new? Lord Davis passed the bill in 2019. We could be putting people, if you think somebody on the street using fentanyl today isn't a danger to themselves or others, you're crazy. They are. And we, could, we, we need to attack it on both sides. We have to attack it on, on the supply and we have to attack the demand. And I think that they're just behind and catching up. There's a lot of good people that are catching up, trying to do it right now. But I think that we really need to express to them the urgency and say, I, I, I wonder why Inslee isn't just screaming and saying, get this stuff out of my state now. I'll put a border around my own state if I have to. And I, I mean, seriously, I, you know, we shut down our, our country for COVID. This is, this is worse. We, we stopped anthrax from coming into our country, which was a little bit of a tiny, and now it seems to me that we're truckloading powder fentanyl into our country and we, we seem to be, it seems to elude us on how to, to stop it. So, um, yeah, I, I, think that, I think that they will catch up though. And, you know, I, I think that it needs to be treated more like a, um, <clears throat> more like a poison than it does a substance, uh, you know, a drug. Mm -hmm. Last question, anybody? Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you so much. <laughs>